is to lead people to follow Jesus in everyday life. We've been in a series called You Do You that reveals the connection between our identity and our habits in life. The first few weeks we talked about identity and today Ronnie's going to talk about a habit that will not only change your life but also the lives of the people around you. If you've missed any of the previous weeks, go back and subscribe to our YouTube channel or find us on your favorite podcasting platform. And as always, there are people on OCC.live and Facebook ready to answer questions or help in any way. Okay, glad that you all are here with us this morning. Um, those of you who are watching online, glad that you're here. Um, welcome. We've been in this series, um, You Do You, and last week we kind of just hit the pause button, had a little intermission in the middle of this, and just I shared with you where we're headed in the next three years. And a lot of that has to do with us moving and having this mindset of moving outside of here uh, on Sundays and being out and in, the, in our community, in uh, where we work, where we go to school, in people's lives. Um, and I want to take a second real quick before we move on. Um, we have an online team that we're growing, expanding. And so like this morning, like Deborah Phillips is on there. So shout out Deborah and Tiffany Brillhart's on there as well. Um, that there are people outside of here. And, and what we're doing is trying to move church, as many of us think, beyond here. Um, this series, You Do You, we started out and we... I've said this a couple of times, and so has Chase or Brian, that a, a, healthy, a healthy identity, when we have a healthy identity, it leads to healthy habits in our life. And when we have healthy habits that support a healthy identity, but if we have an unhealthy identity, then, then these unhealthy habits can develop, and these unhealthy habits, they end up supporting an unhealthy identity. So they're, they're really intertwined. And uh, the first few weeks, we, we talked about the fact that uh, when we come to know Jesus, our identity is changed in who we are. That whether we believe it or not, that uh, believing in who Jesus is and who he says he is and putting our faith in him, we are now in a new family. And that we have family, brothers and sisters, not only here in this room online, but around the world all ages, all time, we're family, even though we don't know how to act like it very well, right? Um, then Brian talked the next week about the fact that we also have this identity of servants, that Jesus came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. And so we, we have this identity as servants, and then Chase shared the fact that we live these sacrificial lives on a mission, that we are sent people God's people here sent to proclaim who he is to live this out. And so when it comes to who we are and our identity, we have to constantly be reminded of who God says we are because of Jesus. Um, now we're going to look at some habits, okay, over the next few weeks. Now, habits, these are tricky. Um, good habits, Take a second and just think about in your life, what are some of the good habits that you have? All right? Just think about it. It's probably hard because a lot of these you just do without even thinking about it. Um, I know for me, a habit that I have, just like on Sunday mornings, I get up early, I go to the gym, I go work out, just because I just want to be awake and like, and that, Sunday mornings, that's just my, my habit, my routine. I, I have bad habits too. Do you have any bad habits? No, 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 no. Um, one, I was thinking about this. If, if y'all didn't read Emily's email this last week, for those of you that, that get that email, go back and look at it. It's so great. Last week I was just sharing with you that like we pick up our phones here, 150, the, the average American, they average 150 pickups a day on their phone, Okay. So she just shared about the fact of like how much time she spends on her phone and that her average is like 98, 99 pickups a day. So she's above, Emily is above average, okay? <laughs> she's doing well, all right? Um, a habit, a bad habit that I have is I will place my phone next to my nightstand because I use it for an alarm, but I will lay there in bed and read just 
to check out, like read news articles or just whatever. And the next thing you know, by the time I put my phone back on the charger, it's been an hour, hour and a half, you know, and just robbing me of my sleep for real. So that's my little confession. Last night, I decided I needed to do something different because I was convicted (laughs) by this message on habits. And so I took the charger and put it across the room on the dresser and put my phone over there. And I did not look at my phone last night. I got one day down. I'm doing great. All right. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Please. Thank you. I should bow. (laughs) Accomplishment in life. Um, It's it's hard to, to break bad habits, to establish new habits, because habits, they are they're powerful. Um. A habit is the intersection of like knowing what to do, knowing how to do it, and having the desire to do it. Habits are consistent in our lives, and they're these unconscious patterns. And they consistently, listen to me, they they reveal our character in who we are. Um, Charles Duhigg, he wrote this book. If you just nerd out on this stuff, it's called The Power of Habit. He just talks about how our brains work and that with any habit, there is a cue, something that triggers what we do. It could be a person, place, thing, environment, whatever. There's a cue and then there's the routine and then there's the reward. And that we begin to understand, he says this, he says, once you understand that habits can change, you have the freedom and the responsibility to remake them. Um, your character reveals your habits. Um, so who we are and who we're becoming is intricately intertwined in our habits. We've looked at this verse over the weeks, and I'm just going to go back to it so you can kind of see this. And this is not a self-help thing. This is not like, oh, okay, well, I need to start doing this. This is all, as followers of Jesus, that we're led by the Spirit, that we're listening, that God's doing something in us, conforming us into the image of Jesus. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature, the identity, who you were. Throw off that nature and your former way of life. This is the habits. This is how you lived in that identity which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And when I look at this, it just seems like you're just going to throw, it's like changing clothes, you know? He makes it sound like you're just going to throw off this old nature, like these clothes, and you're just going to put on the new. But it's not that easy. So over five weeks, we're going to look at some different habits. Listen to me, this is not a checklist. This is not like some religious stuff that you just got to do and check, 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 and you're good. But these will reveal where you are in a relationship with Jesus and following him. There are lots of people in this country, especially, that would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but then let's look at the everyday life and how we live. And so these habits will, they'll show you some things over the course of these weeks Um, And and the other part with this that I want to emphasize, we talked about all this stuff last week about like, hey, this is where we're going the next three years. We, us, together, let's go, let's go. We does not happen unless we individually take this personal responsibility in this. I tell people all the time, like here, like people can come here and all that, but eventually at some point, you feed yourself and you feed other people. Disciples making disciples. Um, so let's get into this. How many of us, how many of us um, we live our everyday lives kind of in this scenario? I really want to help this person. I want to help them, but I don't have the time. Anybody there with me on that? Okay, y'all are all selfish. Fine, it's just me. <laughs> um, I, I really... I, I really see this person's need, and I, I want to, to help financially, but I can't. Anybody? Man, I, you know what? I can 
I can pitch in $10 or I can give $20, but I really wish I could do more. Anybody with me on this? I wish I could help, and then we'll use the the church word, and, and bless them, but I can't. Not right now. How many of us want to, to bless people and we lose a little bit of hope and perspective every time we say, I can't? Just not now. It, when things change, if in a week, in a month, and, and we quit thinking about and living out this purpose that God has, has for every single one of us. So today, this is going to be challenging because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us to a place of coming underneath why, why, why we struggle with this. And also to look at um, how we can change our habits to look more like Jesus. Okay? Let's take a second and I'm going to pray. Father God, you know, um, you know every single one of us by name. You know um, the people who are in this room. You know the people that are listening online right now and the people who will be listening throughout the week and months following. And right now, through your word and by your spirit, I ask that you would penetrate our hearts and our minds so that we could live free, so that we could live in hope and trusting that you are good and that you are God, that you're over all and that you know us and you know what we need. So just speak to us, and I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Um, so if you have a Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to be in this, this story, and uh, it, it's, it's a historical event. It happened. It's factual. And, and it was so important that out of what we would call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is one miracle that is recorded in all of them. So it's that important. So just to set this up so we understand what's happened, J- Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, man, he, was, he, w- he would say whatever God told him to say. Let's just put it like that. Well, he got in trouble, got thrown in prison, and then the next thing you know, um, he gets his head cut off, like for real, like head on a platter, Real deal happened. Jesus finds out that John, John, his cousin, the one who baptized him, the one who was to come and prepare the way for Jesus, was now dead. So Jesus, he with, withdraws. We look at this in uh, Matthew 14, verse 13. Um, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. He withdrew. He made space for silence and solitude and not to spoil anything. But next week, this is what we're going to talk about, about listening, about enjoying, embracing silence and solitude and being alone. Because for a lot of us, the scariest place to be in life is alone and in quietness. And it's evident by the noise around us all the time, and we love the noise to distract us. We're going to talk about that next week. Um, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the town. So they follow Jesus from one side, of the, one side of the lake. They walk around to the other while he's on boat. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Now, this was not just a crowd. This was like 15 to 20,000 men, women, and children. People had been there all day listening to Jesus. People were healed, but nothing's worse, honestly, than a hungry mob of people, right? So like... The disciples, like their reaction and response to this is, it's not unrealistic. I mean, but can you imagine, 
like seeing, like, like that day, seeing these people and the, like the emotions and just being so drained at the end of the day. Can you imagine being there, 15 to 20,000 people, and, and this boy who's never said a word in his life now utters the words mom and dad for the first time. The guy who was carried there by his friends because he couldn't walk, and Jesus heals him. The excitement, the, the unbelief, the, the young woman who has lived her entire life in darkness because she was blind. And in a moment, Jesus touches her eyes and she can see. So thinking about being there all day in the middle of this with thousands of people. Jesus, you healed a lot of people today. Like, send them, you did enough, all right? So just send them on. They're going to get hungry. Everybody's tired. Verse 16, Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Like us? Are you kidding me? Like, we don't have anything. There's a lot of people here. And Philip was a math nerd. Any of y'all math nerds? Okay. Well, guess not. Uh, he was a math nerd, so he's like, are you kidding? Like, this would take half a year's wages, like 200 denarii. It's like, this is like over $14,000 just so everybody would get a bite to eat. And, and so there's, there's no way. Now, I want us to look at someone else's account of this, John, who was there that day. Here's what John, John wrote. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? So you notice the words to Philip. John overhears this conversation with Jesus and Philip. Where are we? Where are we going to buy bread? Listen to me. As we go through here, Jesus is in this if we let him. If we let him and we don't try to do things on our own. Philip's like, no way. There's, there's this half a year's wages. John's account says this. He, he asked this only to test him. For he, Jesus, already had in mind what he was going to do. This is so important for us to understand. There's a testing in this for the disciples and for us. We, just like the disciples, we see things from human observation, from personal perspective. And I'm telling you, what we're about to see, it can change the way that we live our lives, the way we think, the way we believe. And it can change our habits in the everyday And, and my prayer this week has just been that the Spirit of God would renew our attitudes and our thoughts in this. So after hearing Jesus teach all day, heal people, Jesus has a plan. He said, like, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. Verse 17 here, going back to Matthew. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. So after asking around through all of these people and assessing, hey, what do we got, people? Here's what we have. We have five loaves and two fish. Jesus says, bring them to me. Those words will wreck your life. Bring them to me. Bring yourself to me. Bring whatever you have to me. Bring what you've found to me. Bring what you've discovered to me. These the words of Jesus in this soon to be miracle, they humble me and they bring me to a place of asking, asking a question that leads to another question. These words bring it to me. What do I have? What do I have? 
The same question for you, asking that question, what do I have? The disciples said, hey, we have here only five loaves and two fish. How, how often in life our attitudes and our thoughts about what we have is like, well, I only have this. All I have here, you know, I, I don't have hardly anything. In my current situation, I don't have enough. Remember, when, when it comes to our life and to our habits, that our attitude and our thoughts are crucial. Our faith is tested. But will I bring what I do have to Jesus? And do I believe that he has a plan? Because it's not about what we, what we don't have or what we only have. This forces this assessment of our own life right now, September 2020. What do you have? What do I have? And I'm not looking at what you have, because that's yours. I'm looking at what I have. But that question really leads me to another question and it's this right here. It's not what do, I, what do I have, but what have I been given? What have I been given? Five loaves of bread, two fish. If we go down this trail, where, where did that even come from? Someone made the bread. Someone caught the fish. And now on a random Tuesday in July by this lake, this is what we have. This is all we've worked for. Can you imagine someone saying, hey, whoa, 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 why are you asking me for this? Like, that's my fish. Like, I was out there all day. This is all I got were these two fish right here. Or somebody to say, oh, whoa, 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 this is my bread. You know, like, I, we went out, we picked the grain, we threshed it. We did the work. This is mine. I worked for that. See, this is where this is where we miss this. We miss it. No. You did catch the fish, but God made the fish. He allowed you to be in the right place and time to catch the fish. Oh, the, the bread? Yeah, I know, I know you made it. But who caused it to rain so that the crop would grow, so that you'd actually have something to pick and something to work with? We live in the land of capitalism and consumerism. I worked for it. It's mine. When in fact, anything and everything we have is from God. Everything. The breath in my lungs is a gift. We take it for granted. Go to bed at night, wake up. The people in our lives are gifts. The talents, the abilities that God has given you, it's a gift. Like, you didn't do anything to have that. I didn't either. Just the fact that we live where we live, wow. Changing the question from what do I have to what have I been given it, 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 it changes our perspective, our attitude on what we have. It gives us this attitude of really being grateful and not of entitlement. Um, and I also see in this too that I have responsibility. Jesus says, bring me what my father has given to you. So verse 19, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. So just think about this real quick. 
15, 20,000 people in groups of 50, that sounds like a nightmare, like trying to get these kids and everybody into these groups of 50. I don't know about you and like leading people and getting people. No, it sounds, it happened though. Remember this, Jesus said, where will we get the bread? Watch this, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. So in this, he models for us looking up and giving thanks and asking God to bless what what he has. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. I love this because I I do this a lot of times. I'm like to do all the what ifs, you know? And I'm like, oh man, what if the disciples brought this to Jesus? Like, hey, we only have like five loaves and two fish. And he's like, Good, because I worked hard today and I'm really hungry. And he just like takes it and he's like, I'm hitting the boat. I'll see you on the other side, you know. Or what if the disciples are getting all of this from the people and then they start talking and they're like, hey, listen, Peter, take that loaf because we're going to need it. There's a lot of people and I don't think this is going to happen. I don't know what he's doing, but we need something for ourselves. Or what if they just found it and then they just kept all of it and like, Jesus, I don't know, man. These people are poor. We got nothing. Send them. Send them. I'm done. Don't miss this. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. Catch this. 12 disciples handing out this food. I'm no math nerd, but if you think about it, there's 12 disciples, there's, let's say, 20,000 people. That's 1,600 portions of disciple, you know? Like, that's a lot. Like, me carrying 1,600, me personally, physically, carrying 1,600 portions around the people, it's impossible. It's impossible. What was blessed multiplied in the hands of the disciples. Do you catch that? What they had, they gave to God, to Jesus. He blessed it, gave it back to them the same amount. Five loaves, two fish. And as they made their way around, it multiplied in their hands. What was blessed multiplied in the disciples' hands. I believe with everything in me that the reason why so many of us struggle in this, like I want to, but... Oh, I wish, but I'm, I'm just not able to bless more until the reason why we habitually struggle is because our trust has been tested and we haven't developed habits of knowing that what we've been given, where, where it's come from, who's given it to us, And we haven't developed the habits of taking to him what we've been given first and giving him first our best because we know where it came from. And believing that he'll bless the rest. This is glaring. It's almost as if, just picture this, You are sick. You don't feel good. You don't feel good for days, for weeks, for months, and it gets worse and worse. You go to the doctor, and he says, you're sick. Like, we did the scans, and we see some stuff going on. And here's what we need to do. What would your response be? Would your response be like, ah, whatever, I'm good. I'm just going to keep on. 
Would it be like, hey, I'll come back to that one appointment, but that other stuff, I, I don't really know. I'm going to just... I'm saying this. We, and I know it's a generalization, but remember that you and I, we are a part of we. There's a sickness, and the test results are back, and it is glaring. Americans give to causes or charities 1.1 to 1.4% of their yearly income. Christians in America, followers of Jesus in America, we are doing so much better. Like 1.5 to 3.1% of what we've been given. Four out of, of 10 People who attend the church give nothing at all. Only one out of ten consistently give a, a percentage of what they've been given. The national average of people who actually tie to their church is four percent. Like it's like and this is not, listen to me, if you're like, if this is in your church or what, like, I'm glad you're here. I'm not like trying to twist your leg or anything like that. I'm just trying to be like, hey, I'm just like, I'm not the doctor. I didn't go to school long enough for that. But like, well, this is what's happening. And I think more than anything, what, um, what gets me is like now even Christians, like, listen, this church, we would have, we would have had to let go of some staff through this pandemic if it wasn't for the government coming in and helping. And to me, that's sad. It's very sad. That we're now trusting Caesar more than God because we ourselves are not in this. And it's so ironic. One nation under God, we write, in God we trust on our money we have a problem. <laughs> We're trying to multiply loaves and fish before we bring to God what he's provided to us first. Now, I, I know that I'm sitting on this a little bit today because we need to. Like, it's just because when it comes to blessing other people, I'm going to encourage you this before we go, but like, like you, can, you can bless people financially. You can do things for people like acts of service and serving people, words of encouragement. These are all ways to bless people. But as a country, it's like, oh, we'd rather go do this over here because that's going to cost us something. Test our trust. Jesus was not wrong when he said, where your treasure is, your heart is also. It's a reflection. This miracle could have happened so many different ways. Jesus could have, he could have blessed this, and he could have, it could have just been one long communion line, and Jesus is like, he didn't do that. He could have, in that moment, they're like, hey, send them away. They're all hungry. I'm like, hold up. Come on, make it rain. <laughs> like, he could do anything, anything, but he chose this way. There's, there's a purpose. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. We are blessed to bless others. My test is in believing that I'm blessed and then acting in this, living in this. Months ago, my wife, she, she really is. She, I am who I am because of her. And she said this a few months ago with Logan on the podcast that we do on Wednesday nights. But like at the end of it, we always end with some kind of words of wisdom. And she just said, live to give. 
Like this is how we live our lives, knowing who we are and, and giving to other people, serving other people, loving other people. Wrap this up and it'll be done. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. That's no coincidence. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. They all ate and were satisfied. And there was enough for the disciples. They could trust God with what they'd been given. He blessed what they'd been given. They blessed others with what they'd been given, and their needs were met, not their greeds. Am I in the habit of blessing other people? And before that, do I trust him first with what he's provided for me? I never will forget this moment because it made a mark on my life, and this guy has been in my life He's one of the overseers of this church, but um, I was on staff at another church years ago. This has been 15 years ago. And I never will forget on that Sunday, standing down there at the front, and he came up to me. He said, Ronnie, come here, come here. I was like, yeah. He goes, I have a question. It's a little personal, but I just want to know. How much is your mortgage? I was like, at that point, I didn't really know him that well. I was like, whoa, hold. Come on, man. Like, and so he's like, no, no, no. I just, I just. So he told me. I mean, I told him. And then he proceeds to pull out a checkbook. And I know some of you are younger. You're like, what's a checkbook? No, like, <laughs> it's, it's a joke. I'm kidding. Um, but he just wrote out my name and wrote out the amount of our house mortgage. And he just said, here. And he, he proceeded to just tell me, like, God owns it all. All of it. And, and we, we live at this place of knowing that he provides in his abundance. There was no limit. I, I mean, I could have added a zero to the end of that check if I'd have been thinking, you know, like, oh, well, you know, we live in a big house and we got like a three-year note, you know, so. But I'm going to tell you this right now. He would have still written that check. Because he wanted me to see this whole thing of being blessed and like, this is how we're to live. This is how we're to live our lives. What we've been trusted with isn't for us. It's not. He's going to provide and take care of us. So I, I want you to think about this. What's God placed in your hands, like in your hands? And take some time to actually count your blessings. Like if you have to, like spend 30 minutes with a sheet of paper or your phone and pick it up for that 150th time of the day, whatever, <laughs> and just start a list of what he has placed in your hands. Like, count your blessings. Put it all down. You have a job? Awesome. You have a roof over your head? List all the stuff that's in that place. The people. So much. And then take a step. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So whatever that is for you, but listen to me. I'm going to be really clear about this. Very, very clear. We'll talk about this next week, but listen. Listen to what God is saying to you. Do not be emotionally manipulated. Do not be just all over the place. But listen. Listen to what he's saying, who he's bringing to you, and then do what he says, whether that's write a note, send a text, make a phone call, put money in a mailbox, whatever, but listen to him. Okay? Let, let's live to give and know that we're blessed to bless others. Would you bow your heads?
I just want you to take a minute and just like I just want to cut through any of the the heaviness, the weight of this. Like God knows you. He knows where you came from. He knows the background family you came from. He knows right where you are right now. And um, for, for some of us who are followers of Jesus, like it's a very real thing for us to just sit in and whoa, man, have I, have I been like sucked in to this Western culture of that it's about me, that I earned it, it's mine. And, and to, to, today, to take a step back and go, this earth is not my home. This isn't about my own kingdom or a kingdom here. God, this is about your kingdom that is eternal, that goes on forever. And if I sit and I look at what I do with what you've given me, it's hard. And so today, I, I just want to pray for those of you maybe that are in that place of just um, conviction, conviction, the Spirit of God convicting, and it's a good thing. And that today there'd be a change. Habits would change. Desires would change. Knowing what to do would change. And God, I just pray for those who um, are in that place. Just knowing, looking up, thanking you, giving you what's first, not what's left over, and trusting that you're going to bless, that the desire is there to bless people around us every single day. For some this morning, um, you may not really know Jesus. You might come to quote church and, 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 and you're here and, and I'm glad you're here but maybe today just the realization of God's been so gracious so merciful and he gave he gave his best and Jesus came here that's the plan he's fully God fully man came here to walk among us to live a perfect life to model for us this life and yet he was killed and died to pay a debt that we owe and that today that maybe seeing and understanding God's love his mercy his grace and this Jesus who came and not only died for us but defeated death and is alive will come again and it's a faith a trust in him nothing that we do that makes us right with God because he is the only one who is perfect and that by placing our, our faith our trust in him confessing him as Lord and Savior that we are saved that anyone who calls on him is saved and they can live in this new identity a new way of life God, may we humble ourselves before you and knowing that we're dependent on you. That we need you every day, not just through a pandemic, but we need you every day of our life. And may we live our lives trusting you in all things. And I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. We are so glad that you joined us. And we have a few questions for you to process or talk about with the people that you might have watched with. Number one, are you in the habit of looking up and bringing God your first and your best? If not, what are some of the obstacles before you? Number two, what has God placed in your hands? Take some time to count your blessings. Write it down. Type it up in your phone. Send it to somebody. Number three, read Mark 6, 32 through 44, um, either with yourself or with others, and put yourself in the story. What would it be like to have food multiply in your hands like the disciples? How would this change what you believe about God and His purpose to bless you so that you can bless others? We hope today has challenged you 
And our prayer is that this message would encourage you to follow Jesus in your everyday life.